God, we come to you now, and we want to open our minds and our hearts to receive the information that Nathan will share with us today. God, we thank you for his ministry at Ross Bridge, and um, God, he works with a dear pastor out there that helped bring me into ministry, John Mount. And so, God, I just pray now that you would be with him in and through what he speaks, that his words would be of the Holy Spirit and not his words, and that we would just lean in to the Holy Spirit as we continue to, to discern which direction and how God is leading us. God, we ask a blessing upon the ears and the hearts of the receivers today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, let me introduce the speaker, but I want to thank him so much for coming. I, I know, uh, you know, we want to hear what he said, but he preached today. He made it here from Ross Bridge to hear, to, so that took him a little bit of time. Of course, then we had the uh, techno technology problems back there, but we got it all straightened out, I think. Um, Nathan is the minister at church at Ross Bridge. I think he's from Andalusia originally. Uh, he's been in Birmingham since about 2010. I think he has three children, uh, from what I remember reading. And I really do appreciate him coming and talking to us about what the independent church, Methodist church, offers us. So if you will, come on up, Nathan. Hello, church. Uh, I'm glad to be with you. My name is Nathan Carden, and at Alan's invitation, happy to be with you to try to be helpful to you as a church during a very tender, important time in the life of local congregations and the United Methodist Church. Uh, I've been praying for you as I soon as I got the invitation to come, because I know that these are important, but consequential times, and I pray that God's Spirit would be among you to lead you, and also between us at points of disagreement. So, the presentation that I have for you today is probably quite different than what you may have received from uh, representatives from the Global Methodist Church, or the Free Methodist Church, or those remaining United Methodists because I'm not here to represent a larger uh, church organization. Uh, we are now an independent church, and so I'm here to give you the perspective of a church that decided to withdraw from the United Methodist Church and are now self-governing as a, under kind of a congregational polity until a time may come in the future when we choose to align with a denomination or a network. Our church's decision is based highly upon the context in which we're located. And so I'd like to tell you just a little bit about our church, where it's located, because these factors informed the ultimate decision that our congregation made. On this slide, you can see that we are a new church plant, really a replant of a pretty old church. So our church goes back to 1902. We were a church plant uh, in the Glen Iris neighborhood which is essentially where UAB Highlands is presently, a church plant of Birmingham First Methodist, which at the time was one of the largest churches in the country. And it remained in that location as 11th, 11th Avenue Methodist Episcopal Church, which then became 11th Avenue United Methodist Church in 1968 until 1989. But as the steel industry declined, uh, UAB, UAB began to grow. There were less residential uh, pockets within that part of downtown. And so the congregation made a decision to sell their property, relocate, and they broke ground on a new property in 1992 um, They on Aldersgate United Methodist Church on Lakeshore Drive. Well, that was based upon some projections from the city of Birmingham for a 5,500 home development between where Sam's Club is on uh, Lakeshore Drive right there at I-65 and where it intersects 150 out in Bessemer. And uh, before they broke ground on all those planned homes, uh, the city of Birmingham rezoned it for Oxmoor Corporate Office Park. So the church had bought property there and broken ground there, and then this anticipated residential movement in that area never came about. So when they heard about Rossbridge Community um, in 2008, they began to pray and decided that they would kind of lay their future on the line to replant themselves a second time as Ross, as church at Rossbridge United Methodist Church. 
So they began worship there in 2012. My predecessor, Reverend John Mount, was their pastor from the year 2000 through 2017. And so he shepherded the congregation to that location. And I became the pastor upon his retirement in the summer of 2017. So I've been there now a little over five and a half years. Um, John actually came back after a year of retirement, and he helps us with congregational care. So when I arrived, the church had around, I would say, 55 to 60 per week in attendance. It was a small kind of family-style church, very healthy, very loving, very generous. But the church had really not been able to effectively reach those in the immediate vicinity. Crossbridge has 14 neighborhoods, 6,000 people, and about 1,900 homes. And when I arrived, less than about 10% of the membership of the church actually lived within that immediate context. And so since that time, God has blessed our church. Um, our church, as you can see, the, the weekly attendance and membership there, um, our membership is around 340. We worship a little over 200 a week, an additional 135 or so online. And we've gotten to the position financially where we are ready um, in this, the second half of 2023 to break ground on seven acres that we have in the community. So these factors all played into our church's decision to withdraw from the United Methodist Church. Um, so with that said, let me share with you our discernment timeline so you have a sense at how we arrived at our vote. Now that text is quite small, and so I'm kind of going to go through it some with you. Back in April and May of 2022, the way that I chose as a pastor uh, through prayer and discernment and conversations with a couple of mentors, the way that I chose to handle this from the pastoral perspective was, my thought was, it is a far secondary thing for a church to decide which denominational bucket it ends up in. A more important thing is to decide what we believe is true based upon the revelation of God, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And the first step in that I thought to my church was they deserved to know what their pastor believed, what my pastoral theology was. And so I scheduled a series of small group meetings during which I shared about a 90 minute presentation. And that presentation was in three parts. Uh, what is happening in the United Methodist Church, what does the church believe presently, and what does your pastor believe to be true? And so in that, I disclosed uh, my own pastoral understanding of the nature and love of God for all persons, the sanctifying work of God's Spirit in our lives, and the outcome of that sanctifying work, which includes understanding our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit, and that all Christians are equal, all persons are equally loved by God, but as people grow in faith and sanctification, we all have to understand ourselves, our bodies, as part of Christ's body. And so the implications of that being that I felt I could only conduct ceremonies that uh, I understood as based in New Testament Christianity and the history of Christianity, and so I held those nine small group meetings. And at the end of those meetings, I said to the church, um, there are four outcomes to this conversation that you can, you can walk away with. You could first decide, you know what, I believe in the, the theological position that my pastor has presented, and I'm going to stay. This is my church. Second option is, I disagree with the position that my pastor has presented. I wish my pastor had a different position, but this is still my church and I'm going to stay. The third option is I disagree with the position my pastor presented and I would not be able to grow here as a Christian and I need to find a new congregation in which to worship. And I said, if that is your conclusion, um, I grieve that for our church, for you, but you need to know that I would try to help you find a church that you felt like was in line with your belief system, and I would not consider it a burned bridge. We would part, my best case hope would be we would part blessing one another. The fourth option is the position that I've presented is in uh, conflict with the majority of the church position, in which case you probably need to request a new pastor. 
That's, I hope that's not the case because I feel called here and I love this congregation. But I would honor that and I would work with you and the district superintendent to facilitate that transition. After I held those nine small group meetings, um, I decided that I'd, I'd reached about 101 people in attendance across the nine meetings and I felt like the church at large who had not attended the meetings deserved to have that same information. So I made a series, or just two videos a part one and a part two. The first one was, here's what is happening in the United Methodist Church to the best of my ability. I gave a brief overview of the 40 plus year conflict. I talked about the way the church operates from the local church level to the district, to the annual conference, to the jurisdiction, to the general conference. Shared about the outcome of the 2019 general conference, but that some in the church were unhappy with the traditional plan that passed and so there were some pastors, churches, bishops that were abiding by the current discipline, and there were some that were rejecting and dis disobeying the discipline, uh, but that there did not seem to be um, corrective action um, or enforcement of the discipline from some bis bishops in some areas of our connection. And so that was creating kind of a, um, a great clash in the denomination, and that was bringing about the fragility that we're experiencing now. That was the first video. The second video, um, I wanted to go into my pastoral understanding of some of these presenting questions, and I wanted to do so with great care, because all of us, I am sure, have people that we care about who would identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community, myself included, friends and family. And so I know one thing is for certain, Christ would have us speak in ways that dignify and honor them is we do have to address and respond to what's happening in the church. So that second video, with your permission, uh, my presentation today will, will not be probably more than about 35 minutes. And then if, there, if it's appropriate to have questions, I'd be happy to stay for as long as I need to. I would like to share that second video with you um, at this time. Well, hello again, church. Greetings to you once again in Jesus' name. This is part two of a video series that I'm offering you to give you updates and information about the status of our United Methodist Church. In the first video, we covered how the church works, how we're governed by a book of discipline, how decisions for the global church are made every four years at the General Conference, but how the church has been unable to resolve its differences related to human sexuality, marriage, and ordination for pastors. In this video, I want to once again revisit my two objectives. The first is to provide clarity. I provided clarity about what's going on in the denomination in the first video, but in this video I want to provide clarity about how I, as your pastor, understand these important questions and how I intend to help lead our church forward as long as I'm the pastor here. Secondly is to foster a culture of compassion within the church. My goodness, if Christians are known for anything, it ought to be our love for one another and for people who are hurting. And so we will honor Christ in one another. If we think about people that might be personally affected and we try to honor one another at points of disagreement. Speaking of compassion, I'll admit to you, I've been hesitant to speak publicly about our denominational breakdown. Not because I lack clarity around my understanding of Christian doctrine, but rather because it's such a public conversation about such a personal matter that doesn't impact someone like me. You see, I'm a straight married father of three, and I've been so incredibly blessed to be married to my high school sweetheart for almost 17 years. We have three kids, both through birth and through adoption, and I will finish this video, and I'll go home to a family that loves me, and I love them in return. I have not walked in the shoes of someone who experiences desire and attraction very different than me and around 95% of the general population. So I've been hesitant to speak really publicly or strongly about this. You know, as a pastor, you get to know people well. And through my pastoral relationships, my friendships, and even in my own extended family, I've come to know and love and respect members of the LGBTQ plus community. In this conversation that's taking place in our denomination, my great prayer would be 
that for people in our church who are personally impacted, I would want you to know that God loves you far more than you could understand. I would want you to know that this pastor loves you. And it is my hope that our church always conducts itself consistently with the character of Jesus Christ in all that we do. With that said, I am what you might call a theological conservative. What I mean by that is not the kind of conservatism that refers to a person's personality when they're overly cautious. And I'm also not talking about the kind of cultural or political conservatism or liberalism we discuss. When I say theological conservative, what I mean is this. I want, first as a Christian and second as a pastor, all of my thinking, all of my worldview to be given shape by the witness of Scripture and the consensual wisdom of church tradition. When I approach the Bible, I try to understand the Bible with an informed reading. We're not literalists or fundamentalists. We don't believe in cherry-picking scriptures. Instead, we believe that some scriptures are descriptive of the human condition. Others are prescriptive for how we should live our lives. And I want to aspire to the highest and closest reading of the witness of scripture. In church tradition, I want to look to the wisdom of other men and women who have gone before us as they faced similar kinds of questions over time and trust that God's Holy Spirit was guiding them as well. So, whenever I'm challenged to think or rethink about a Christian doctrine, I make an appeal to these sources of authority, Scripture and tradition. I recognized in reading the scriptures that Christian marriage is not a footnote. In fact, there are over 31,000 verses in the 66 books of the Bible. Out of those 31,000, there are over 1,000 references to marriage as constructed between husband and wife. From the very first page of the book of Genesis all the way to the last book of the Bible, marriage is not just a personally fulfilling, convenient social arrangement. What I mean by that is this, that the marriage between husband and wife, which creates the procreative capacity to bring new life into the world, is in the Old Testament the primary metaphor between the relationship that Israel has with God. And in the New Testament, marriage is the primary metaphor for the relationship between Jesus Christ and us his church. In addition to those sources of divine authority, over the past two or three years I've also done extensive reading across a variety of subjects and a variety of fields. I've read secular psychology and sociology around gender construction and identity, around same-sex attraction. I've read affirming Christian authors who believe that all manner of sexual expression you must be affirmed within the church. I've read conservative Christian authors, some of whom are even much more conservative than the conclusions that I arrive at. I didn't embrace every conclusion as my own, but I was blessed and informed by learning more about this important topic before the church. As a pastor, I do believe that God's highest intention for our lives is to understand the Christian marriage covenant as defined with a lifelong exclusive covenant between one man and one woman. And I am not comfortable claiming authority to create new definitions of marriage and then pronounce them in God's name without biblical justification for that decision. It is not born of any negative feelings toward anyone in the LGBTQ plus community. If anything, it creates a great feeling of tension and feeling conflicted in my own spirit something that I have to pray for and about on an ongoing basis. But I do feel like that's what God has called me to do, is to preside at Christian marriage ceremonies as defined as a lifelong exclusive covenant between one man and one woman. Now, there are other Christians that would disagree with that conclusion, but that's the conclusion that I've arrived at after great study and prayer and conversation with other trusted Christian colleagues, some of whom share my convictions and others who have different convictions. And this would be our commitment to a member of the LGBTQ community in our congregation. We love you 
We want the love of Christ to be made known through us and through our fellow members. We will do everything that we can to love and support you on your journey of faith in following Jesus Christ. This presentation is not exhaustive, and I know that there must be questions that have been left unresolved for you. But allow me to close with this word of assurance from me, Pastor Jessica, and Pastor John. We will offer and model the unconditional love of Jesus Christ toward any person that walks through our church doors. We will always try to unify our diverse congregation around the person and work of Jesus Christ, whose great commandment was to love God and to love our neighbor. While we will offer clarity about our understanding of Christian marriage, we will not make dogmatic public statements about sensitive issues that would be used to harm people or create division. We're not going to embarrass you by things that we say from the pulpit. We will encourage each other to lead with love, treat one another with compassion, and maintain a spirit of humility. While God does call pastors to teach doctrine in the church and to clarify doctrines in times such as these, we are not anyone's judge, and we will leave that into the loving hands of a gracious God. I offer to you the invitation that I did in the first video. If you have unresolved questions, or if you'd like to have a conversation about what you've heard, please know that I and Pastor John and Pastor Jessica are open to speaking with you. Please reach out to us by email so that we may find a time to speak by phone or in person, because we believe that the Holy Spirit is with you, with us, and between us as we move forward together in Christian unity. Thank you for paying attention and taking an interest in this important conversation. To God be the glory. Amen. As I watch that video, I'm struck that the camera adds at least 10 pounds. Um, okay. So in April and May, I shared nine small group meetings and then followed in June with two videos, the second of which you've just seen. In July of last summer, our leadership council, now when I use the term leadership council, what I'm referring to is there's a provision within the Book of Discipline that allows for the combining of your three required committees of trustees, finance, and staff parish into kind of a, a group where you have sub-teams, the three sub-teams, but they kind of function together um, with the pastor in an advisory capacity. So we combine the three of those together to make a 12-person leadership council, and they are empowered to make every decision in our local church that does not require, by the Book of Discipline, a convening of the administrative council or full church council. So we have an additional 18 persons that serve on our administrative council. So our leadership council appointed an eight-person discernment team to begin to study all the complexities of the issues as it relates to denominational governance. They were not really debating theology and practices in the local church uh, because they, they felt like that question had been resolved from the videos and small groups that I had shared. And so they were studying things like what might the implications be of remaining in our current denomination? What about joining the Global Methodist Church? or the Free Methodist Church, or uh, the Wesleyan Church, or the Church of the Nazarene, or some other Wesleyan expression, or perhaps even becoming an independent church. These eight persons, I asked them to function independently of me. And the reason for that is I, I said I was available to provide input at their request, but I had clarified for the church my pastoral theology, and I felt like the congregation needed to discern without me tipping the scales one way or the other, where they felt like God was leading them. So at their request, I met with them twice out of about 12 of their meetings, and then they invited in some persons from other churches to consult with them as well. They began meeting in July. In August and September, we held what we called a Moving Forward campaign. Some of you may have heard of the Moving Forward curriculum that is available to churches written by Reverend Lana Johnson. It was designed initially for churches coming out of the shutdown phase of the pandemic to figure out, okay, well, how do we need to change to do ministry to reach people now that the world has changed a little bit? 
but it set the stage perfectly for a congregational conversation like you all are currently having. So that campaign took the form of seven Sundays of preaching. We weren't preaching about matters of conflict in the United Methodist Church. We were not preaching about outcomes for denominational alignment. I was preaching specifically about the process of spiritual discernment. What does it mean for the people of God to seek the will of God together? During those, that 40-day campaign and across those seven Sundays, we had about 130 or 40 people involved in small groups. They had a moving forward workbook. They were reading scripture and praying every day and meeting once a week to discuss what they felt like God was um, giving to them and, and providing for them. And during that time, they were, the leaders of those small groups were taking feedback. And so, for instance, if there was a question asked of a small group, um, what's one thing about our church that should not change? Whether it's a particular ministry of ours or an aspect to our congregational culture, and then everybody gave feedback. The leader of that small group was writing it down. And each week, they would take feedback from the small group members, and at the end of the 40 days, each small group produced a large poster that we had given them, and they provided their feedback to the different questions on the posters. We then hung those posters in the church for three weeks so that anybody in the church that was interested could go by and read what the feedback was based around these various questions. At the end of those 40 days, our discernment team sent, made a video similar to the one that I shared with you here, and our chairperson said to the church, we are your discernment team. You've heard about us in the newsletter. But we're getting ready to make a recommendation about whether or not our church should remain in the United Methodist Church or conduct a vote to disaffiliate. But before we make our final recommendation, we want to give a specific invitation to you to submit questions or to make comments to us via email. So they opened up a 10-day window where that team received questions and comments from the congregation. I think we had about five or six questions total. After taking that feedback and question, those questions into account, the discernment team published a letter to the congregation suggesting that the, or recommending that the church hold a vote to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. Following sending out that letter, uh, in the letter were two dates for open forum congregational presentations. These were not a town hall where people um, were, you know, had opportunity to speak into a microphone, that sort of thing, uh, because we, we understood the sensitivity of the conversation and we felt like it was appropriate for people to submit questions ahead of time rather than someone possibly being tempted to make a speech. So um, at those two meetings, which each were 45 minutes, the discernment team offered three reasons why they felt like it was in the best interest of our local congregation to disaffiliate from the North Alabama Conference of the UMC. I'll share those three reasons in just a moment. After those two presentations, the church held a vote on November 6th and voted to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church, and that was ratified by the North Alabama Conference on, at the December 10th Special Called Annual Conference meeting. So what I would like to do now is just share in brief actually part of the uh, presentation, some of the slides and information that we shared with the congregation at those two informational sessions after the team had recommended a vote to disaffiliate. So the first reason had to do with fair share apportionments. Yolanda Nina was a member of our discernment team that shared this. On the next slide, she was simply explaining the way that local church support gets filtered to the district and the conference and then beyond to the general conference. And we give 10% of our church's non-designated giving. Um, our church, in the five and a half years that I had been there to that point, had paid a 100% of our apportionments during that time. On the next slide, they shared um, the way that our apportionments, the actual amounts that we had paid um, each year up to year to date in September of 2022. And then they began to, uh, in the next slide, talk about some of the benefits regarding or related to apportionment giving that we felt like were, were prudent for the congregation to be aware of. Uh, they were making a recommendation to become an independent church. 
And as we looked at the conference budget, our assessment was that there's a lot of wonderful things, significant things that the North Alabama Conference does through, through shared ministry and apportionment giving. But there was also considerable overhead, considerable. And especially with a church that um, in our case has been growing over the last five years and has some exciting things coming up in the future, we were concerned that um, the structure, the institutional structure of the North Alabama Conference and some other annual conferences was such that as church is disaffiliated, um, the conference would be left with decreasing apportionment dollars, but some of, a lot of the expenses were fixed. And so our concern was that our apportionment numbers would go up um, and a lot more of that would be devoted toward the fixed overhead expenses of the North Alabama Conference. And so we felt like as a matter of stewardship that we wanted to make a difference beyond our walls, but that we could do that uh, without um, risking the, the health of our local congregation by giving the monies directly. Um, so, as I'll share later, we still pay apportionments. We just decide to designate them directly to ministries, some of which are still United Methodist ministries. We still support some of those, uh, but they're just not given through the denominational structure. On the next slide, um, the, there was our local church's disaffiliation exit cost, which initially was 143000 which later dropped down to about $82,000 um, as it was reassessed in October. And so in the next slide, we shared that the expense of the lump sum disaffili disaffiliation cost, we believed would be recouped uh, within, um, you know, well within that number. It ended up being within about six months uh, because our annual giving uh, continued to increase. The second reason why our church considered, uh, or our discernment team recommended disaffiliation had to do with the trust clause. Now, as you probably know, uh, paragraph 2501 of the Book of Discipline says that all property and assets of local United Methodist churches are held in trust by the denomination for the benefit of the entire denomination. Uh, this originated uh, under John Wesley's guidance and direction, and there is some historical records to show that Wesley required local church properties to be held in trust by the connectional denomination to ensure the teaching of sound doctrine in those churches uh, so that they had some leverage if a church were to go astray from the Wesleyan understanding of historic Christianity. In our church, uh, I'm not going to go through these next slides because they would just be relative to our context, but essentially when I got to the church in 2017, we were meeting in a building that was loaned to us. We did not own it. And in 2018, we had the resources to purchase that building. We added about $800,000 into the renovation of it. And so this is our church building currently. It's kind of a uh, halfway step toward our new property that we'll break ground on later in 2023. And so our concern was that with the um, uncertainty, even in the North Alabama Conference, and um, the really tenuous institutional situation, we didn't feel comfortable breaking, borrowing money and breaking ground on a you know, multi-million dollar project um, and the organization, which is in a very tenuous, uncertain time, still having legal um, control or claim on our church's property. So we can move forward now to the third section, which was the third reason, which is the pastoral appointment process. So those of you who are in the room probably are aware that in an overview of the appointment process uh, Laura Middleton shared is that clergy are uh, appointed by the bishop who is empowered to make and fix all appointments uh, within the annual conference of North Alabama, and they're made on a yearly basis. And even if the pastor, the staff parish relations team, and the congregation may desire continuity in leadership, an appointment may be initiated by a district superintendent or bishop if there is a greater need in the North Alabama conference. Well, part of, again, I, I keep emphasizing that our context is unique. In the spring of 2022, um, against my preferences and against our congregation's preferences, um, I was 
uh, told that I was being considered for reappointment to two different churches. Um, first one that was further north and the second one here in Birmingham. And um, ultimately, our staff parish team was able to talk our district superintendent into the understanding of how critical it was as we're about to enter into a building campaign to have continuity of leadership. And so some of the decision of our discernment team to recommend a vote and our congregation's vote is because the congregation was anticipating this exciting project and felt like it would be unwise to initiate that project if, in fact, at any time, um, they're, they're, they may have a change in pastoral leadership. And so um, that was a significant factor in the church's discernment about what they wanted to do. So under the appointment process comparison slide, which is a couple forward, uh, they compared the current United Methodist structure. If we remain in the UMC, there would be no change to current appointment processes. Our staff parish relations committee served in an advisory capacity rather than in an executive capacity. Pastors are sent, of course, by our bishop, and the bishop is essentially the final decision-making body. If we were to disaffiliate to become an independent Methodist church, we would no longer be bound by the appointment process, and it would establish continuity of leadership. Pastors, as an independent church, are called or hired by the local church. And so both the pastor would have right of refusal to go to a church if they decided God was not calling them there, and the congregation would have um, the decision to make as to whether or not they would extend the call to a pastor or to exit a pastor from, the, from their church. The, in our church, we decided that the leadership council, those 12 persons, finance trustees, staff parish, would be endowed with the authority to appoint a search committee for the search and hiring of a new pastor when that time comes for pastoral succession or replacement. So I just have one final slide to kind of catch up who we are as a church because many of the questions that Alan submitted to me about how are bishops elected, how often do you have a general conference, What's the role of the district superintendent? Those at this time now for our church are not applicable. And so there's a final slide here um, that kind of gives it an outline of the way our church is structured internally. As an independent Methodist church, we now function with the same internal lay leadership structure as the outlined in the United Methodist Book of Discipline. So we still elect our trustees, staff parish, and finance team members on a three-year rotation. Uh, we still have an administrative council that approves a budget in December. They approve pastoral salaries in December. Uh, we still have a lay leader that belongs to finance trustees and staff parish. Uh, and so we're still functioning under those provisions because we found that the internal structure of United Methodism was working quite well, even if the external Episcopal structure uh, was facing significant challenges and uncertainties. So we are incorporated as a religious nonprofit in Alabama. We maintain all of our same Wesleyan theology and worship practices um, as we have received them through the Book of Discipline over the years. We have redirected our apportionment giving to local and international mission partners. And when it comes time for pastoral succession, as I mentioned, our leadership council will appoint a committee authorized to conduct a search. And our local church remains open to affiliating with a new denomination or an existing denomination or network in the future. But we felt like it was wise to allow the dust to settle in our con situation, to allow the dust to settle and for all the different changes to shake out and then to begin a process of evaluation. Uh, so we considered Free Methodism, Global Methodist, um, and others, but some of those we felt like were not um, it fully, they hadn't had a constituting convention yet, and while there was a transitional book of doctrines and disciplines, again, given the sensitivities of our context, future building, and so on, we did not want to leave risks behind that we felt like the denomination could interfere with our goals to move into a new denomination where there may be some other kind of impact uh, during a very sensitive time in our church life. So with that, um, I will pause there, and Alan, I'll leave it in your hands to decide how to take the next step. Question. Is 
That's a great question. The question was, has anyone in the church expressed disappointment in become, moving from United Methodist to Independent Methodist? There was a time of, uh, it was a very solemn decision. Our church was not torn apart by conflict, and neither was our church rejoicing at the decision. Because for most of the people in the congregation, um, most of them had some kind of United Methodist legacy. And the people expressed, you know, this is sad because I was baptized in the United Methodist Church and confirmed and married and I raised my children and so on. But there was an overwhelming sense that we felt like we had no other choice if we were to follow what we believed was God's future for the congregation. So out of our vote um, was 97.16% to disaffiliate. To my knowledge, there, um, I've not had anyone in the church tell me that they've left the church because of this um, directly. I've had um, fewer than five people privately say, you know, I understand that you feel like you need to follow the scriptures and so on. I wish we could take a more progressive position, but this is still my church. So I've had a few of those conversations, but there's been very little um, negative reaction to being free of the potential disruption. Uh, you covered the uh, trust clause, but I was unclear. And does the independent church own its own property? Thank you. I, I didn't state that explicitly. Our church owns its own properties outright without any other external entity having a claim. What do you, uh, what do you see as a great disadvantage of being an independent church? I would say a disadvantage currently would be that there are a lot of benefits to being a part of a connection. And our church will be eagerly seeking to forge some new connections in the future. We don't know yet if that will be through a network of independent Methodist churches or um, perhaps joining a denomination. I, I would say for our congregation, for the short term, there are very few disadvantages. We do want to establish those positive connections of accountability and maybe shared mission. But I think every church is different. And, and what I mean by that is, I'm 41. I intend, by the grace of God, and as long as I feel like God has called me to that congregation, to be there for many years. But there are some congregations that might have a pastor who might be within five or eight years from retirement. And if they were to vote to become independent, they would need to know, in my opinion, know going into that decision, we need to have a plan on the front end. What will pastoral succession look like? Because they may not be a part of a connection that will send them a new pastor should their pastor retire or take another position. So I, I do think our church longs for that sense of connection, but we want, long for it in a sense that is mutually life-giving and fruit-bearing rather than filled with distrust and, and fear of external disruption. I hope, I hope that's helpful. My ha question is, if we vote to get out of the United Methodist Church, wouldn't we automatically be independent Methodist and we would have to join something else like Global if we wanted to do something else? It is my understanding that your, your church really has two decisions to make. This is the way we understood it. The first decision was, do we want to remain or feel like we should remain in the United Methodist Church or not? That was decision number one. A secondary decision was, should we go ahead and make a decision to align with a new entity, a new denomination? And what we decided was, you know, this is kind of like going through a divorce, even though it wasn't driven, you know, wasn't conflict oriented in our church, it was still a solemn decision to separate after 119 years of history. We didn't feel like it was wise to get remarried 
immediately. And so we wanted to give it a little bit of time. Again, let the dust settle on different things that are happening and then make a decision that was based more about where is God leading us rather than a sense of, well, we've got to make a decision now. Well, we really don't. We can, we can stand on our own two feet for some time as an independent Methodist church and then pray and discern together about that next step. Some churches, though, I will say, I am aware that some churches will hold a congregational vote to disaffiliate and then right immediately after that, that same time, will hold a vote for reaffiliation with the new group. Do you know what we have decided to do? I do not. Hi, my name is Carolyn Matthews. Um, I actually grew up in Aldersgate and 11th Avenue, so that's kind of where I grew up. Um, in talking about finding a pastor, I know that within our church, our pastors have already spoken to us about where they're drawn. So should our church make that decision to move towards independent, would there be a body that would help us find pastors that align with our church's beliefs, um, or would it be up to our congregation to go out and find that? That's a great question. So there would be, if you become an independent Methodist church, there would be no ecclesial structure or governance that would assist in that. However, there are independent groups, cons consultation groups, um, Vanderblumen out of Houston that specializes in pastoral succession and search processes. And so that's one option that we became aware of in our research. And they help some really high profile churches identify clergy. And I think, you know, one of the sad outcomes of the next several years in United Methodism will be that not every church and pastor will end up making the same decision and not all the same numbers of pastors will be available to serve the various groups that emerge. And so if you had 100 churches and 100 pastors in a conference, for instance, uh, the odds of 60 churches and 60 pastors all deciding to go this direction and 40 pastors and 40 churches go this direction so that while there may be some change up, there's going to be, it's probably not going to be that way. It might be 60 churches decide to make one decision and 31 pastors align with that decision and vice versa. So uh, in the short term, I do th anticipate there will be um, some disruption to the typical way churches have found and exited pastors before. Um, real quick, uh, my name is Paul Asbury and uh, my question is about you know, the United Methodist Church has their Book of Discipline. The Global Methodist Church has their transitional Book of Discipline. Uh, what is the church at Rossbridge doing to um, kind of declare their beliefs and um, protect uh, from 40 years down the road there being some, you know, it, it changing drastically? Or, or you know, you, if you have the pastoral succession, you just never know if things are going to, you know, hold to what the original intent of the group was? Good question. The December 10th annual conference um, here in Birmingham ratified the congregational votes, and we became an independent Methodist church on that Saturday. The next morning, December 11th, following our 1030 worship service, we assembled our administrative council, and the first resolution that we passed was that we will continue to operate by the theology and guidelines of the current United Methodist Book of Discipline until such time that the congregation adopts new bylaws, doctrines, and guidelines. So that's our current, that's the way we would resolve disputes if we had some. We will likely, in the next 60 to 90 days, as part of our incorporation process, adopt some new bylaws um, for instance, there are a couple of things that we will probably change. For like, um, elders in the United Methodist Church are not members of that local church. They're members of the annual conference. And one of the attorneys on our discernment team said, you know, that's one thing that we should probably change. If we're an independent church, our pastor is a member of our community of faith and not beholden to a higher uh, Episcopal structure. So our pastor should also be allowed to be a member of the church. 
So we'll have a couple of minor changes there, but for now we're operating by that. And then what we adopt in the future will likely include a provision where if the church body um, were to desire to make a change fundamentally to its structure, we would probably put a, a threshold somewhere north of 80% uh, for that change to be made to doctrinal practices and so on. So it's not impossible, but it would, be, it would require a, a real significant change. Curiousness. Do you feel like being an independent church presents opportunities for more growth? Uh, have y'all talked about that? Thank you, Terry. So in case you couldn't hear, his question was, does being an independent Methodist church provide more opportunities for growth? I'll answer it this way. Anybody who is involved in American Christianity to any degree is aware of the, the pain that the United Methodist Church is going through right now, and they're wondering what local United Methodist churches will do. Because as, as you're aware, there's a tremendous amount of diversity in the United Methodist Church. And so I think people appreciate having clarity about what you believe. And I'll just tell you what happened in our church was we voted on December the 10th, or actually, excuse me, it actually began happening after the November 6th vote. Um, within the next three weeks, we had four households who had been attending our church, but they had been waiting to figure out what the church was going to do before they made a commitment to join. So that may not be the case for every congregation, but that's what happened in our church. And what I find pastorally is that I'm no longer in the position of having to um, explain or defend some things that are happening in other places of United Methodism that are, are very difficult to explain or defend. Um, so I, that, that's not something I feel obligated to do as a representative of the denomination now. And so uh, I, we feel a certain amount of freedom from that. I have a question um, about the property. You say you own the property. How did that come about? Did, did it just automatically become yours, or did you have to pay something to get it? And do you own a parsonage, and was that part of it? So any properties held by United Methodist churches, whether they are church buildings, uh, un uninhabited properties, or parsonages, um, the trust clause affects those properties. And so the North Alabama Conference has a claim to those properties. Once we disaffiliated, uh, actually on the date of the annual conference, we received a piece of paper, a legal notarized piece of paper from the counselor's office, the legal representative for the North Alabama Conference, releasing the church at Ross Bridge from their trust clause. And so we then uh, presented that to now, we have one property that's owned free and clear, it's paid for, one that is financed. And so we presented that to our lender, and they went through the process of claiming the, changing the language on the deed. Uh, so it did not cost us anything other than the general disaffiliation cost in order to be released from the trust clause. Um, you mentioned that you became a nonprofit status in Alabama. Um, did you just go through a lawyer to, to gain that, how to do that, or what? I think that would be a big thing. Don't you have to do that pretty quickly? So you are required to do that by, it's my understanding, by December 31st, 2023. That's my understanding of it. Um, our process was that we did hire an attorney who's been working with some Methodist churches there in Tuscaloosa, and it was a lot more simple process than we anticipated. So they basically file a piece of paperwork with the Alabama Secretary of State um, that changes the name of your church because we were not Church at Ross Bridge, United Methodist Church. Uh, we're now just Church at Ross Bridge. And so we went through the name change process, which was very simple, and we're currently, they're currently in the process of finalizing this coming week 
our new incorporation paperwork, which will be filed with the state. We anticipate the cost to be around $1,800 to $2,000 for their legal services to do that. So they were very familiar with what we were requesting, and it was not much of a change. Um, it doesn't change anything about the way we operate internally, but keeps the same uh, tax benefit provisions and so on that we, have, we had previously as a United Methodist Church, now just as an independent um, nonprofit. Yes, so um, the insurance, our church was paying our property, casualty, liability insurance independent of the annual conference anyway. So we contacted our broker and said, okay, if we vote to become independent, will that change our rates? Do you all see that as a higher risk? And the answer was no. Um, you will still be insured with no change to your premiums based on whether or not you're connected with the denomination. Now, in terms of pastoral benefits, that is a little bit different because Clergy benefits are paid um, by the local church through the North Alabama Conference. So the conference provides the insurance, uh, disability, death benefit um, for clergy, but the local churches remit the premiums for that. So what our church did, um, similar to how we replaced the pension plan for our clergy, is that we contacted a financial advisor and said, here's the current United Methodist retirement system for pastors. What would it look like if we were to create our own retirement system? And they came up with a very simple formula that um, our church agreed to. It saves our church about $3,000 a year for what they were paying for the lead pastor and associate pastor's pension plan. And it's essentially a 403B which is like a 401k option for a nonprofit. And so it's managed by whoever that, we actually are keeping ours with Westpath, uh, who manages the United Methodist Church's investments. They provide that at no cost. Um, so we feel like we've got a very comparable system and we're actually optimistic that it may be a little bit more beneficial um, for the clergy. In terms of benefits, um, the local church is now responsible for providing health insurance benefits for the pastors. So all we did was we took the plan that our program and administrative staff qualify for, and now the pastors have that same plan. So all the clergy, program, ministry personnel, and administrative personnel our church have the same uh, health insurance plan uh, together. Yes, ma'am. Right down front, we've got one here. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Your name? Sue. Sue. I'm just saying independent is a big word. Sure. What does it mean for Trustville United Methodist Church? Well, I think that's a decision that your lay leadership, pastoral leadership, discernment team have to answer, and then everybody has to pray about together. Um, every church is in a different context and has different needs, has different hopes for the future. So I won't answer that church for your local congregation, but I will say this. You know, I, I don't have anything disparaging to say about the United Methodist Church. It's been my theological home as a pastor for 15 years, made some wonderful friends, did wonderful ministry. Um, it's provided, enabled me to support my family. So uh, I'm not dismissive of those realities. But in our discernment process, again, as we considered where we were, and the concern that the disaffiliations would create a secondary effect that might create more reshuffling of appointments, that our church's immediate goals could be derailed. And so we kind of came to the conclusion that right now in the United Methodist system across the board, the general church is depending upon local churches to maintain its security keep it afloat, keep it moving forward. And unfortunately, the general conference and local annual conferences cannot provide the same kind of reassurances and security to local churches. So 
as because General Conference was unable to resolve the ongoing conflict, um, it, it's getting kicked down the, the flow chart to local congregations. So it does feel like there's some risk, and we were a little bit nervous about that too. But once we kind of realized that the main kind of support the annual conference could offer to our church if we were in a crisis had to do with sending a new pastor. And so once we realized, you know what, we think we could, with the help of others, we could identify a new pastor. We could bring in retired pastors to serve as interim and things like that. That gave us a little bit more confidence that it was the right decision for our church. Hey, my name is Mike Dennis. Let me apologize, first of all. I, I think my question's been covered, uh, but maybe I was a poor listener or I'm a little uncertain of it, but my question is this. In regards to the physical property and the trust, is there a certain date that we need to keep in mind that would be beneficial for us to settle that trust? In other words, is there a deadline? Yes. It's my understanding that paragraph 2553, which is the primary um, provision for local congregations to exit the denomination at this time with their property, um, especially here in North Alabama, is by the end of 2023. So not every annual conference is allowing churches to exercise the provisions of that paragraph. For instance, in South Carolina, their bishop essentially said, nope, nobody can use that. And so if churches there want to leave, they're facing a different set of circumstances than churches in North Alabama. Uh, my view of Bishop Wallace Paget was that she has been very fair and gracious um, and has maintained a position of wants to bless churches that feel like they do not want to remain in the United Methodist Church. So it's my understanding that, that the provisions of that paragraph will expire at the end of this calendar year. And in North Alabama, there are two additional annual conference meetings scheduled uh, for the purposes of voting on disaffiliation decisions. One is in May and the other is in December. After the 2023 provision uh, expires. Uh, there has been some messaging from the North Alabama, the NAC3 team, uh, of which I was a part uh, from June through October until our church decided to vote, that the conference trustees would try to be gracious and understanding about that. Um, however, our church and our discernment team said, we would like that to be true, but really the only guaranteed set of criteria that we have right now is within this timeline. So they decided we don't want to delay any longer, and they decided to recommend a vote for disaffiliation. Does that answer your question? Hey, one more quick question. Somebody may have asked this question a while ago, and I didn't get the answer. Your new name of your church, you left off United Methodist. Can you still use the word Methodist in a new name? Y'all didn't use Methodist in your church name. but is Yes, churches may. There are around 80 different Methodist expressions in the world. Uh, the United Methodist Church is the, currently the largest of those. But like the term Free Methodist, that denomination, and others. Uh, so our church name is just named after the community in which it's placed but on our website under who we are and our doctrinal beliefs and those kinds of things, uh, we identify as an independent Methodist congregation, but it's not a part of what's on the sign out in front of the church. But legally you can still use the word Methodist. Yes, sir, you can use the term Methodist, but not United Methodist after the church disaffiliates. Any other questions? Going once. Going twice. No, I'm sure that, uh, as Nathan said earlier, he'll probably stay around for just a few minutes in case someone should want to walk up and ask him a question that you think of while you're getting up or whatever. Uh, 
on behalf of the discernment team, I want to thank you very much for coming over and talking. It's been very informative for me. I, I know the group's been very, it's been so for them. So uh, with this, David, uh, and I'm going to ask David to come up and dismiss us with prayer. Um, thank you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come to you this afternoon. We thank you for this time that we've had together to learn from Nathan about the independent church. We pray, God, that you'll continue to abide with us in this season, in this time of discernment, that you'll guide us in your ways, and that you'll help us uh, just to continue to do your work and your kingdom in this world, in this day. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.